In every walk with nature, one receives far more than he seeks. Fitting words from America's most famous naturalist, John Muir, known as the father of America's national parks. Oh, stop. You hear that one? Recently, a new generation of natural wanderers embarked on a monumental task in the national monument named in his honor, the Muir Woods. Enjoy the rain. We're all going to get wet. Glenn Plum is chief wildlife biologist for the Park Service. He's leading a team of grade schoolers into the woods, armed with a video camera on a pole. Now, the fun thing about this is we don't know exactly what we're going to find. Plum and his volunteers were part of a bold effort called a bio blitz. Let's pick one plant to focus on, OK? So let's pick this one right here. It's a 24-hour inventory of every species living in the 116-square-mile area. <laughs> Organized by National Geographic and the National Park Service, more than 300 scientists led swarms of school kids, families, and volunteers on a mission to count every type of plant, animal, and insect. Approach the tree. Let's take a look. Yeah, that's, that's it. Approach right in the middle of it. No fear. Plum's part in the cataloging was to see if they could videotape bats sleeping deep in the hollows of giant redwoods. And what would be one of those telltale signs that a bat's uh, it, been here? It could be uh, a guano, a smear of guano. Where there's guano, there's yep. bats. There's guano, there's bats. We're looking for, for bat poop, and you know yeah. that bats have been there. Yeah. Did you see any? No. Stretching from the edge of San Francisco to the towering redwoods of Muir Woods, the Golden Gate National Recreation Area sees 14 million visitors every year. But what scientists want to know is not who visits, rather what calls this park home. Normally you'd have a park ranger like me yawning, you get back on the trail, but today you get the free pass. Marine biologist Michael Reichmuth led his team of amateur scientists to Muir Beach. Go out, go out a little bit to your right. Where the Redwood Creek meets the Pacific Ocean. Keep coming this way. We suited up to follow along. Yeah. Now at least I like the park. As we waded through the mud and brackish water in these newly restored tidal lagoons, our goal was to tally every fish in our trawl. So go ahead and get on your knees on the outside here and take fish and put them in the buckets. We found plenty of baby sculpin and stickleback. 60 millimeters, yeah. Fish that have adapted to live in both the ocean and fresh water. When I see this, I think I actually see the kids making a connection with their natural resources. They're seeing that they actually do have fish in their backyard, and I think they get excited about it. Above it all was Steve Sillett, just hanging out, 25 stories above the ground. This is a small tree. This tree is about 76 meters. The tallest tree is almost 116 and still growing. The professor of ecology at California's Humboldt State was part of the first team to ever survey the tops of these giant redwoods. When you can get out into the woods, and particularly if you can get up into the canopy in such a large organism, then there's a point where you lose sight of yourself and there's a real calm that comes over. Hundreds of feet above the ground, Sillet counted more than 40 different species of lichen dripping from the redwoods' branches. And he studies the tree's growth rates by taking core samples. You punch a hole in the trunk and you pull this piece of wood out and the history of the tree's growth at this height is revealed here. It's like looking at a history book. It is. That's what's cool about trees. They record everything that happens to them in the rings. Oh, and here's another one just like it. In all, the scientists, students, and volunteers recorded more than 2,300 different types of plants and animals, including a mountain lion, all right in San Francisco's backyard. You don't have to be a professional scientist to do this. You can be a citizen scientist. And discovering the biodiversity of your national parks is truly an American experience. This year marks the 100th anniversary of John Muir's death, and the world has dramatically changed. Yet somehow, the magnificent redwoods and the forest that bears his name 
have adapted and thrive. The mere scale of this ecosystem humbles. We think we're so damned important, and you walk in here and you realize you're just a tiny little creature. We only have these tiny little lifespans compared to these trees, and yet they never can move. Look what they can do standing in one place for a thousand years. What could we learn from them? A lot, I think.